This points the way to a another deeper question about just how physics is or theoretical particle physics is supposed to progress at this point, because you said that this is the one experimental result that played a role in the development of th string theory. And that, of course, is one of the biggest charges against string theory is that it doesn't have experimental confirmation. But my understanding is that one of the problems with this, or one of the reasons this is the case, is that phenomena related to quantum gravity are only really salient or manifest themselves on very small distance scales around the Planck scale or in places like the center of black holes where we either don't have any access to uh, or we can't generate enough energy to get access to. And this raises the question, I mean, in the absence of experiment, which has historically guided a lot of the development of physics, how is physics supposed to progress beyond the standard model? Slowly. <laughs> you know, we can only take what nature gives us. Um, there's, there's something that I do like to point out, which is that the first half of the 20th century was just astonishingly productive for revolutionary discoveries in physics, from special relativity to the uh, existence of atoms, to quantum mechanics and all of its various guises, quantum field theory, radioactivity, but then general relativity and special relativity and the expanding universe and the Big Bang, all of these are from the first half of the 20th century. And we got spoiled. You know, the whole second half of the 20th century was just spent having fun cleaning up what we discovered in the first half of the 20th century. And maybe we did it very effectively. So we're in this very strange position right now where our theories are really, really good. You know, we had these fine tuning problems, et cetera, but to a good approximation, our theories explain all of the data that we have. And when they don't like the dark matter, the data are just too kind of simple to really give us a lot of guidance as to what direction to move forward in. It's not that we don't have good theories of what the dark matter could be. We have too many. We have far too many, and it's hard to decide between them. So, you know, there's there's a couple of different strategies here, and it, it sounds sort of um, unhelpful, but one strategy is just keep plugging keep working at it, you know, push experiments to higher energies, push uh, cosmological measurements to greater precision, push your theoretical predictions uh, and your model building to ever more clever ideas, and maybe we'll get something. We don't know. Eventually, we, we will, but we don't know when it would be. And then the other strategy, which is what I currently favor for my own personal self, is to take a breath, to step back, and to think deeply about the foundations of these theories. Is there anything that we've glossed over? Remember, we told the story of quantum mechanics and how physicists are like, all right, show me the money. What, what can I do with this interpretation of quantum mechanics stuff? No, all right, I'm going to move on and do other things. Well, now there's not a lot of other things to be done. In the 40s, there was. Now we're still stuck with the same problems we had 10 years ago and 20 years ago. So it makes perfect sense in my mind to step back and think, okay, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, fine-tuning, naturalness, the anthropic principle, let's try to really think carefully about what all of these mean. Maybe they will shed some light on these problems that we've had lurking around for decades now. Talking about this strategy of stepping back and thinking about the foundations, I have read this or, or said this a number of times that I so many times that I should have it in my memory now, but your title is the Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy at Johns Hopkins. Is that right? It is. That's right. I picked okay, it. Okay, perfect. So <laughs> you, you were prior to that at Caltech as a research physicist. Is this one of the reasons that motivated your move to a philosophy department? You just wanted to be able to think more about foundations because you think that's where one place at least where the action is moving forward? Yeah, well, I, what I wanted was to be in both a physics department and a philosophy department, and that's what I got. There's no natural philosophy department, just so anyone knows. It's just my title, even though in practice I am in both physics and philosophy. And that's what I really thought was, to me, the interesting intellectual place to be. And very, very few places will let you do that in any productive way. There's plenty of philosophers who think about physics, there's plenty of, there's some, not plenty, physicists who think philosophically, but almost never officially 
almost never in a way that that's your job title. So I'm one of the very, very few people in the country whose job title it is to do both physics and philosophy. And I, I think that's a very, very promising place to think about some of these deep questions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 